Good morning, everybody, or indeed, good afternoon. Welcome to the latest edition of Strange Person in Front of Bookcase, mm -hmm. or otherwise known as the RSM webinars of uh, for health professionals and by health professionals. Now, I hope that on the other screen, very so shortly, we're going to see our guest, Dr. Jenny Harris, Deputy mm -hmm. Chief Medical Officer um, for England. Uh, Jenny will be a very familiar person to you from the um, uh, Downing Street brief briefings in which she uh, currently participates on a very regular basis. She uh, took the post in July 2019 and probably could not have had the slightest idea of what was coming down the road heading straight towards her. Fortunately, she's had vast experience in various public health roles, Deputy Medical Director for, I've written CMO here, but I think I mean PHE, uh, member of the Joint Committee on Vaccination mm -hmm. Immunizations for over a decade and so on and so forth. Now, today's session is probably going to be dominated by what um, Harold McMillan used to call events, dear boy, events. Before we get to that, I, I, we're going to cover one or two specific areas and also the other issue we have, we've already had uh, tons, hundreds in fact, of questions sent in more than any other programme even before we look at those that are yet to come in on Q&A. So we are not going to any way um, get through any of those. So I'll, we'll, I'll be taking a selection as we go along. So Jenny, there you are, it's delightful to see you. Um, I got nervous that you were held in a waiting room. I was told that NHS uh, England has now abandoned waiting rooms, but uh, clearly they still exist in the, in the, in the visual world. Welcome and um, how are you keeping? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Slightly worried by the uh, by the number of questions and the fact that I forgot <laughs> to check my um, bookcase behind me. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, my mine contain lots of biographies of Stalin, which is slightly worrying, but uh, I'm sure yours are far more unusual. I can just see lots of files. <laughs> just Good. move myself slightly in one direction. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm sure there's nothing. Uh, top secret there, although that has happened to some of your predecessors, of, co of course. Um, so Jenny, f first of all, um, what some of the questions I have to say do show some confusion between the role of PHE and the CMO, uh, which is understandable because I'm also uh, confused uh, about who is responsible for what. And I think I'm going to take the first question um, from Graham Winyard, who must, I'm sure, be the Graham Winyard, who is indeed one of your, your predecessors. So he's asking, what exactly is the remit of the CMO, DCMO role now? Um, most people have been confused by the arrival of PHE. And uh, he was said, could you, could you outline what the responsibilities are? And, and equally, perhaps you might want to also say a word about the, the new announcement that we've just got of this joint biomedical security center also answering to CMO. So just clarify a little bit the landscape for us, if you could. Um, yes, of course, it, it might make more sense if I started with what Public Health England does. And as you say, I used to be a Deputy Medical Director for Public Health England. Uh, so that is uh, an executive uh, agency of the Department of Health, but it is separate from it. It uh, brought together over 100 different uh, organisations. Um, to create a single public health agency for England. Um, and so in many ways, it is the scientific and operational arm of public health. So on a practical basis, for example, it has a national centre, but it also has local health protection teams. So uh, if there's, uh, well, let's talk, I'm sure we will talk about COVID. If we're looking at uh, COVID outbreaks, for example, on uh, requirements for advice uh, in a school or a hospital, uh, then it's the local health protection team who deals with it in the area and it links to uh, specialists in public health England nationally, uh, many of whom you'll know, for example, at Collindale or, or Porton. Um, but Public Health England isn't just about infectious disease. The, about 75% was the Health Protection Agency when it, when it was created. Uh, but of course, it covers all areas of public health, which includes uh, what I call healthcare, public health or health service uh, planning and evidence base and um, health improvement. So um, if we then come back to what's the role of the CMO. So the CMO is the head, uh, head of profession uh, for uh, UK. He's the uh, main government advisor um, and uh, obviously in, uh, in Chris Whitty at the moment he uh, currently combines two roles both as the chief medical officer uh, but is continuing to do his 
previous role as Chief Scientific Advisor for the Department of Health. Uh, and the role of the Deputy Chief Medical Officers is obviously to support him in that. The work is really varied, so it may be, I mean, I'm not sure any of us uh, quite anticipated how exciting 2020 was going to be, but um, clearly it is a role to be looking out for all the public health infectious disease uh, events, uh, but it covers anything uh, on the medical front. And so there are two Deputy Chief Medical Officers in CMO's office, um, Professor Jonathan Bantam, who often also appears at the number 10 briefings, uh, usually picks up actually the health protection role um, and he, he I've described him as Mr Pandemic Flu, he's the expert mm -hmm. in that area um, and links very much and is very much involved with the um, treatments and vaccines uh, and my role partly because I've previously had a very broad experience is very much linking in medical advice to systems so for example to uh, care homes, to uh, public health in local authorities to NHS England. So I'll pause there, happy to answer any more questions. I think just, just perhaps just to add this new thing, the Joint Biomedical Security Centre, sounds terribly hush hush, um, but it was announced as well. How's that going to fit in? <laughs> Um, yes, it does. Sorry, I forgot that bit, Simon. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, I think uh, Public Health England has a, uh, has a really uh, big surveillance uh, function. Uh, so it is continuously, many of you will be familiar, for example, with the flu surveillance, which carries on continuously and provides input to government and to the health service, for example, when we're planning through winter planning. Um, uh, and it also keeps an eye out, as it has done in this case, for emerging infections overseas. Uh, but I think what it, uh, so it has modelling, it has surveillance functions and expertise. Uh, but of course, other parts of government have that as well. And I think the ambition here as we go forward and is outlined in the plan which the government released yesterday, is uh, we want a national picture, but clearly it's really important for local areas to understand their local detail as well. And what that um, grouping will do is allow uh, a vast number of flows of information to come in, which will all contribute to our understanding of disease. So it won't just be uh, the cases that are counted in the laboratory, uh, it will be uh, about what is happening in individual schools as well and how that links at a local basis and the impact it has nationally. Um, I, I think what we uh, are recognising is this is really complex to get right. You want maximum freedoms and opportunities and minimum risk for, uh, for the public and the public's health going forward. So having a really slick um, and clever uh, surveillance and data system uh, combined is mo is really important. Okay, well, slick and clever. Who could who could argue with that? Now then, I wasn't going to mention COVID, but now that you brought it up, perhaps I should. Um, we've had a lot of questions on the thing that I think you're directly responsible, which is on shielding. So, for example, Paul Santos has asked a fairly direct question, straightforward. Do you see the shielding measures being lifted anytime soon? Um, I think the short answer to that, and I'm sorry to your uh, to your uh, questioner, is probably no. Um, but I think it all depends on what we may mean by shielding um, and and whether the same people would be in it. So when the shielding program uh, was started, basically um, we had a new disease coming. Uh, we knew uh, in February that there were some characteristics, some variables which put people at higher risk of disease. Uh, we picked that up from uh, uh, information coming out of Wuhan and then particularly as it spread into European countries. Uh, there's a continuous uh, collection of information to understand uh, clinical risks. Um, but equally, you can um, anticipate as clinicians, uh, we also had some what I would call plausible concerns. So uh, individuals who have a suppressed immune system, for example, uh, may not be appearing in the first sets of data that were coming out of, of Wuhan. Uh, but you could predict that uh, their risk of disease would be quite significant. So I think back in February, what we did was took all of that information that we could find, uh, all of our plausible considerations in clinical terms, and tried to identify uh, two groups, uh, 
or, or really we tried to identify one group actually, which was the clinically vulnerable group. We recognised age was important. Um, we recognised uh, underlying uh, health conditions were important. We had a bit of a model because uh, obviously if you take flu, we had a respiratory disease. Uh, we started with flu as a basis for who we thought might be at risk. And that naturally translates more or less into uh, individuals who are advised for health conditions to have uh, flu vaccine uh, vaccination each year. But then having got that group, we tested out the age on the modelling uh, and the real sort of kickoff seemed to be at 70 and above. So that was why that age was, was uh, identified. But then as we all looked at it at the list, we thought, well, actually, we haven't quite captured these very, very high risk, potentially high risk individuals. And on a precautionary basis, therefore, uh, yeah, with the CMOs across the different UK nations, we tried to capture those individuals with specialist conditions. So the obvious one would be uh, somebody with a newly diagnosed cancer who had started to receive chemotherapy. Um, and that actually became that has become what people refer to as the shielded list. Now, that's actually a little bit of a mobile face because people move in and off it uh, as they have had treatments or not, for example. Um, and of course, also, as we learn more about the disease, so diseases, so there is a quite a big piece of work ongoing at the moment, now that we're further into COVID, to try and identify in a bit more nuanced detail uh, what those risks are and if we can perhaps stratify levels of risk for individuals better. And so going back to the original question, if we can manage that, then it may be that the population who we advise to shield are slightly different uh, to the ones who we are currently asking to shield. And that will be because we have growing evidence. It's very complicated to do. Uh, and clearly, uh, it's not quite the same as having uh, an individual patient in front of you. But it's trying to get that as, as good as we can uh, with a growing evidence base. OK. Well, we don't normally um, take a question from Scotland to the English uh, DCMO, but we'll make an exception here. Gary McFarland out of Aberdeen, he's saying that shielding of older patients is impacting on their physical and mental health, which I think, I, I think is, a, is, is true, and, and he may well have good evidence to back that up. Wouldn't it be fairer to advise this rather than compel to shield? How much should you just leave it up to the person themselves to make their own minds up? Uh, I'll come back to what we know about the physical and mental health, but actually this, this is it's a brilliant question because, um, and I'm not speaking for Scotland here, I'm speaking for England, but I'm pretty sure it's the same, it is advisory. Um, and in fact, I spend quite a lot of my professional time um, turning comments, <coughs> excuse me, turning comments back from uh, media briefings uh, or uh, slightly irate uh, individuals saying this is advisory. When uh, the different measures, interventions uh, were put into the uh, English plan, but I, I say English, but in fact all of the UK CMOs uh, speak on a very, very regular basis. Um, when this was put in, there were some very clear interventions about keeping the population safe. So for example, uh, if you're symptomatic, uh, you self-isolate at home. That is to stop you passing on uh, the disease to other people. And that had a particular modelled effect, which is why it was adopted. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and so have many of the other lockdown measures. But the particular measure around the vulnerable was very much, uh, it does have an impact clearly on hospitalisation rates, but it's actually to protect them and in the guidance if you look you can see very clearly the sort of absolute epitome of this is to say that um, an individual who is near the end of their life for example who might be very specifically at risk highly uh, at risk um, it you clearly don't want to be dictating what they do with the last few days of their life this Indeed. has always been advisory it's advice to help them protect themselves it's okay. not mandatory Okay, I mean, perhaps, you know, it's tougher in Scotland. Maybe it's not advice there, but I think you're probably right. Okay, well, a couple of clinical I'm questions. Pretty, but... pretty confident it's the same. 
Okay, I was teasing slightly. Sorry, Simon. There's a there's a delay on the reception. I'll let you. Yeah. Don't worry. Um, okay, so a couple of clinical questions. Um, Karen Edwards at Frimley and Althus. Uh, not sure where they're working. Um, both of them asking very similar questions, one about patients, one about doctors, but it says the, the advice is not clear on shielding. This is for asthmatic patients on steroids and also asthmatic doctors on steroids. Whether Should they be patient facing or should asthmatic patients on steroids, should they be shielding? So quite a specific questions, but clearly of big importance. So again, just to be really clear that shielding uh, is referring to the very top level, if you like, of the clinically vulnerable group. So what I often find in uh, conversations is people refer to shielding for anybody in any of the clinically vulnerable groups. So if we're just talking about shielding, this very top level, uh, what we did, we recognised that you, know, you can have a child with a bit of... Uh, mild uh, exercise induced asthma uh, and their risks are probably going to be much higher for the reasons we said earlier around physical and mental uh, health issues uh, if they're being advised to shield uh, than if they're just getting on with their their daily uh, lives so uh, we recognize it's a really good example of where there is quite a spectrum of disease um, and what we did was worked with uh, various specialists. We worked particularly with the British Thoracic Society so that uh, patients right at the extreme end where we felt uh, clinically there was a consensus that they would be at heightened risk um, were identified. Um, it's like it's obviously the central systems for picking up who's on which drugs uh, and how many times people may or may not have been into hospital. Uh, we can get some of it right from central data, but not all of it. And that's why um, some letters have gone out to individuals from the specialists that they see. So in general, it's going to be uh, only those asthmatics right at the top end of the spectrum who, who effectively uh, have brittle asthma. Uh, and are at heightened risk. So just I, I think um, it may be, uh, I, I know the question, yeah, sorry, you go, Simon. No, just, just to clarify then, so the answer to Karen's question about the doctor on steroids patient facing is going to be a question of judgment. There isn't a bar on them uh, seeing patients, it'll depend on the assessment. That, that it will depend, there is an individual assessment level yes. on this. And I yes. think um, if we look at some of the groups in what I call the, the generally vulnerable, um, I know a number of places, uh, and I've been commenting on some of the, the new workplace guidance, um, are tend, uh, it, there, there is, a, as I say, it's advisory, and there is very much an individual element of this. People have very different risk appetites. Uh, for some people, it would be worse for them for their health not to be going to work. And so for people who like the doctor who's in a probably higher risk environment because they will be seeing people with infectious disease and have an identified uh, clinically uh, vulnerable element uh, to their health, that is about an individual conversation. If they are definitely in the shielded group and right at the top of the asthmatic range, um, they will have had a letter and those individuals we would advise to shield formally, i.e. be out of the workplace and be at home con continuously. Okay. And a fairly quick and last question on this one. Um, I don't normally take questions from the mainstream media because they've got lots of opportunity to talk to you directly uh, virtually every afternoon. But Sharon Brennan from the HSJ is asking, quickly though, what mental health support do you plan for people who are shielding and who are uh, struggling? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I didn't properly answer the, the first time that was posed. So absolutely recognize um, there are not only mental health issues, uh, but people who are shielding have been specifically advised not to go to healthcare settings for their own uh, safety, if you like, uh, unless they are specifically advised to do so. I, I think the important thing here is there has to be a continuous communication uh, between people who are caring. 
some of these individuals will have to go into hospital environments and can be checked routinely. So if you're having dialysis, uh, you don't just suddenly stop. You do go into hospital usually, uh, depending on your own individual circumstances. Um, but there are also local support systems as well through community hubs where uh, volunteers uh, can support individuals, uh, even in things like having phone calls. Many of these people who are really quite isolated and really welcome a call. Uh, the other point is that uh, actually there is uh, an advisory group and I've been contributing to that uh, being uh, uh, led by NHS England very much keeping in mind it's one thing asking people to do this for a few weeks maybe up to a couple of months mm -hmm. but if we're looking forward into something which might continue actually it needs a different sort of care and attention because putting a blood test off for a month might be fine, but it isn't fine to put it off for three months. Um, and so there is a very specific piece of work uh, looking at how services can be delivered safely uh, on a continuous basis through different means, so sort of virtual means. Uh, there's been uh, an assurance each, uh, each patient should have had direct contact from their local clinicians to check up on them. That's another area. And then this piece of work saying, uh, actually what mental health as well as physical health support services do we need going forward? Um, the, the other thing I would say is actually we have done, or rather I haven't done, but the, um, uh, the communities and local government have uh, done a survey, which is wrongly titled, I think, behavioural survey, but it it asks questions, it's asked uh, individuals about what they have been doing, whether they've been observing shielding, and okay. it does ask about mental health. And in fact, uh, we found it's only on the, f the first uh, group of individuals, but that suggests that overall, people's outlook on life, if you like, and the crude uh, um, meter, uh, measurement is actually about the same as the general population, so that's positive. Uh, people report no deterioration overall in their physical health, uh, but there is there is an indication that mental health issues are starting to become of, of a concern. And that's one reason why uh, NHS England have um, put in this group as well. Oh. They're very, very well recognised, I think, and uh, we're trying to pay close attention. OK. All right. Let, let, let's move on. And... Um... Lots of people asked this question. Dr. Richard Nichols, I think he's asked it three times actually, so clearly feels uh, quite strong on this issue. Um, this is the change now about people coming into the country through airports are now going to be tested, or, or well, any, whether tested or not, are going to be quarantined. Uh, we are, that was uh, announced uh, over the weekend. Why the change now, I think is the quote, varying, variations on the theme. But why have we done this now? Um, as opposed to earlier or indeed later. Why now? Yeah, um, it, it's quite difficult to explain this, but I'll give it a go. Um, <laughs> so there are risks of shutting down whole services. If you suddenly lock down the country, uh, not only do you keep people out, but you keep supplies of everything out as well. And it has to be quite a balanced decision. Um, and so even if we think about quarantine, you have to think carefully about who you're advising. Does it include flight crews or is it just passengers? Is it the people who are loading uh, things onto planes? So these are not quite as simple as they perhaps sometimes appear. But the real point behind the question is around the epidemiology of the disease. So uh, when you can contain uh, a virus, uh, which is where we're sort of approaching now, I think, um, it can be worthwhile doing this. So if I said to you, if, I, um, if all of my planes were coming in from New Zealand at the moment, where there is a very low prevalence of disease, uh, actually it's riskier for the person from New Zealand coming in to yes. come to our country than, uh, than it is for us to receive. All right, they would actually dilute our numbers and we would find we had a lower prevalence because proportionate to the whole population, less people would have disease. But if we're going in the opposite direction, uh, currently we do have, I'd say, moderate rates of disease. Uh, so we are a risk to them. So the issue is about what is the prevalence of disease? Now, while it's been high and we've had uh, seed, seeded um, disease across the country, uh, it, 
it really makes very little difference. There's been about 15,000 passengers a day, I remember looking at one time coming in. Most of them were British nationals coming back to the UK. Uh, in any case, they have all been under the same um, social distancing rules as everybody else. And we say to them, go and stay at home. So the actual intervention is just the same. You'd say, go and socially distance. And if you become symptomatic, do that, you know, stay at home. What's going to happen now is as we go forward and our rates of disease drop, it may well be that other countries either have confirmed or we might suspect that they perhaps have cases uh, in, uh, in their countries coming in. And as we manage to tighten and lock down the outstanding cases in this country, then they become a significant risk to seeding new pockets of infection that we don't want to take off. And so as our rates drop, this then becomes a very sensible and practical way uh, of preventing uh, recurrent disease here. Uh, and so that's why it will be brought in shortly. OK, it is complicated. And of course, it doesn't apply to France, as I understand it. No, um, I, I, we, we make advice. Um, I mean, actually, France is quite, quite well, France is quite difficult, actually, because uh, for, for my sins, perhaps in the past, I was directly involved with the um, Ebola screening. Um, and, and actually screening means different things to different people. Uh, and the real elements of it are the same in many ways for um, uh, as we're applying now, is actually really about getting people to understand the risks that they may become ill over a certain period of time in an incubation period and get them to uh, do the right things. Uh, the, the issue with France, and uh, as I say, I had many painful months during this, is we have a number of routes in and out from France, uh, including uh, the, t the Channel Tunnel, of course, and actually managing the the border, the border actually for the train journey is on the French side, not the English side. So there are some quite complex arrangements around this, but I think the principle underlying uh, the whole process is to ensure that people come uh, out of the general circulation at a point where either they have symptoms, British population, or as we go forward, uh, we try and make sure that they are out of the circulation for the period where they may develop them. I mean, of course, once they're here, even having gone through an incubation period, they could catch disease from somebody else in the country, in which case they'll have to do exactly the same as we do. OK, uh, I love that. France is quite difficult. That kind of sums up 700 years of our history. Anyway, look, I'm going to overrun uh, by a couple yes, of minutes. Don't, don't <laughs> quote me on that, Simon. <laughs> Too late. Okay, but anyway, um, to tell, because I'm going to over in a couple of minutes, because there's one other group of questions, and we're no way we're going to get through even a fraction of what's been asked, but what, there's quite a lot coming through on children, and so, two of them slightly contradictory, so I want to give you a chance to answer. What Several are asking about, why are we waiting to uh, advise four to five-year-olds to return to school, uh, or various variations on this, given their virtual, uh, because they don't transmit SARS, on the other hand, two others have asked, why are we advising five-year-olds to, to return to school uh, soon when they considering their virtual inability to manage social distancing? That's obviously from the parent. So which is it then? Should, should we be more bold in bringing the, four, the, the very young back in to school because they can't, they're not transmitting? Or should we, on the other hand, keep them at home because there's no way a teacher can stop them from social distancing? Where are we positioning ourselves? So, so I think one of those is a very practical question, which I'll come back to on the social okay. distancing. And the first one is very much about what do we know about uh, transmission yes. Yes. in children? And that first one, uh, the things we definitely know with a lot of confidence is that if children get disease, get infected, uh, they generally don't suffer severe symptoms, if any. So they, they don't get severity of symptoms. And we think also they probably uh, get less clinical disease. I just need to point out that there are kind of two groups of children. Uh, so if you take children up to about 11 to 13-ish, 
um, uh, there are there appears to be lower risks generally i'll come back to that um, right. but for the older children uh, for teenagers um, there's less the evidence is uh, less clear um, and uh, i think there's a lot that we don't know about that when you look at the younger children, there is there is some evidence that suggests that they probably do get infected uh, at similar rates. Um, so I think there was a comment somewhere around carrying, uh, but they probably, but the evidence is not really strong yet, they probably transmit less. So I think the question goes back to how confident, how strong is that evidence currently the issue about getting severe disease is very, very clear. Uh, there are a few cases, but very rarely are children uh, ending up in um, paediatric intensive care, uh, which is very good. And there are strong indications that they uh, transmit less frequently, but the evidence base there is still growing. And it is the, the new studies, the ONS surveillance studies, which will give uh, a lot of information on that going forward. So I think that's why we're being a little bit cautious. Uh, it's, it's not 100% black or white. Lots of good evidence abroad. So I was on a call with um, the Dutch uh, Public Health uh, Institute a little while ago. Um, and in fact, interestingly, they have never stopped their children, their young children, uh, playing in the communities. They go back to separate homes um, and they are just opening up their schools. And actually the infection rates have stayed very similar. But I think uh, it's as much as the rest of the policy is we're trying to be very cautious about that. The evidence is still growing. So I think that's the infection bit. When it comes to uh, trying to social distance uh, a five-year-old, I, uh, I had four children under five at one time. <laughs> so um, I, I can understand why that question has arisen. Yeah. Um, there are, I mean, broadly, we recognise that you can't actually uh, completely stop that happening. But in fact, if you have children in a school environment, um, it's often a more controlled environment. Uh, and so it's easier to, to uh, manage, to instill good uh, behaviours as far as you can for that age group. Um, and uh, you can do physical things. So uh, if they're sitting at their small desks or small tables, uh, you can still move the tables apart. And the advice is about trying to overall reduce the risks, the amount of social contact. And the social distancing rule in the UK is also set at quite a precautionary level. It's two metres. Uh, that's based on projections of droplets spreading if people are coughing and sneezing. Uh, but actually the World Health Organization advice is one metre. Some European countries have 1.5. So we're fairly precautionary in this country. And I think that should be helpful to people in understanding uh, that it's about trying to manage the risks overall. There are principles of managing them. I mean, I think the other thing we need to highlight is that the age groups that have been chosen are those who, um, the, the areas where they're most likely to miss out on the longer term for education. So there's one thing managing COVID, but actually if that child starts its education uh, late, it's delayed or it misses out, it's likely to have uh, life uh, public health uh, health issues for, for, for that individual. They may be less likely to succeed at education, less likely to be in employment um, and have worse health outcomes overall. So there's, there's some real difficult balancing on this, I think. So we've, we've allowed to overrun a little bit because we were slightly late starting. Um, I've also been told that uh, just now that actually you've been the audience to be looking at me because your video has been freezing. So each time I nipped off for a quick cup of coffee or whatever, everyone has seen that. Oh. Oh, well, now, one of the things of this series is we like to give our guests time to give proper answers to proper questions. And uh, we're not people who call Nick who keep trying to interrupt you. That does mean we barely touch the surface of what people uh, would like to have asked you. So we're going to have to get you back again, Jenny. But the very last bit, someone has said, what's been your greatest challenge to date during the pandemic? And now I, it, it's common knowledge, of course, you, one of the things is, of course, you yourself have had uh, COVID and, and delighted to see that you're back. Uh, and uh, I'm sure everyone's <laughs> very pleased with that. But go on then quickly, your greatest challenge, and then we quit. 
Well, if, if, we're, if we're doing open secrets, um, if you do my Myers-Briggs, I'm a complete introvert, actually. So uh, <laughs> to actually uh, uh, find yourself on a podium at number 10 was never on my job description. Uh, I'm sure people would say, why did you apply for the job as Deputy Chief Medical Officer? Uh, but hopefully that indicates I, I, uh, I'm driven very much by uh, trying to do the right thing in my job. Uh, and also, uh, I think the reason I did apply for it was because having worked on the ground in primary care, in uh, PCTs, in, uh, within local authorities, uh, I always used to be amazed when I went to a national meeting and realised people were very happy to have advice from the front line. Uh, they just often didn't seem to know quite where to get it from. And so my drive for being a deputy CMO was actually to bring real life into the middle of uh, policy discussions. Um, and of course, I've done that in rather a big way by having to stand at number 10 uh, on the number of occasions. So that probably is one of my biggest challenges. Yeah, I can well appreciate it. Well, look, and you do it very well. And uh, can I just thank you for taking time out of what must be, by any stretch of the imagination, a pretty taxing job at the moment, and we wish you all the best. And indeed, we will see you again. Now then, uh, thanks to all of you who tuned in. This is part of our RSM COVID program by Health Professionals for Health Professionals, which will continue. Um, and thank you for your support. The next date for that is this Thursday, 12.30, when Mike Rawlins is going to be talking drugs to Stuart Ralston, the chair of the Commission on Human Medicine. So it'll be a session on drugs, basically, in all shapes and forms, of which Mike is more than an authority. And then in between, um, you've got to keep this quiet, okay, so don't tell anyone, but uh, Sir Andrew Parker, who until last week was the head of the security services, MI5, will be in conversation with me, uh, no doubt from some secure uh, location. Um, that's going to be one bookcase that I bet we don't get to see. So 7 p.m. tomorrow, turn on to or tune in or whatever it is you do um, to hear me in conversation with Sir Andrew Parker. Now, uh, finally, um, I normally end in the style of Hill Street Blues by telling everyone to be careful out there, but obviously that messaging has now changed. So I am now instead say stay alert out there and thank you for listening. Good afternoon.